Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I am your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links under my Instagram accounts. Check me out either on at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. This is from a book called Your Story is Your Power by L. Luna and Susie Herrick. We are volcanoes. When we women offer our experiences as our truth, as human truth, all the maps change. There are new mountains. That's what I want to hear. You erupting. You young Mount St. Helens who don't know the power in you. I want to hear you. Ursula K. Lagoon. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. T.S. Eliot. When we, whether we realize it or not, we define ourselves through stories. Understanding your own story is the key to understanding yourself, your world, and your capacity to act within the world. In the heart of your story, you will find you, your voice, your power, and your, and your truth. And because there is only one you, you are unique in all of time. Your story can be known and expressed only by you. And we need your story, your point of view, and your feminine power now more than ever. We are at a juncture where we need women's voices, women's intelligence, women's compassion, women's courage to help us navigate the difficult challenges that our species and our planet face. We use the word woman to apply to anyone who identifies with being a woman, regardless of their birth sex. When we say feminine, we are speaking to the feminine energy that lives in everyone. It is our deepest hope that We can help you guide to the center of your story so that you can share your voice and your true gifts with the world. The labyrinth is an ancient metaphor for the journey, and it is the organizing principle behind what we're talking about. The point of a maze is to find the center. The point of a labyrinth is to find your center. In a labyrinth, there are no robot robots roadblocks or tricky turns. The path flows continuously like water, spiraling and meandering as it goes. It is not a direct line from one point to another, but an organic, evolving process that takes time and moves to its own rhythm. Similarly, the path through this book is designed to help you spiral to the center of your story and then out again giving you ways to digest what you discover and to create space for new insights and emerge. May the meandering, renewing, and turning path of your story continue to guide you home. Priscilla Scherer says in her book, Awaken, 2 Kings 5.1 Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Social media has made voyeurs of us all. We carefully study and judge the lives of others discovering things about them by stealth that we might never ask in person. But what we've mainly gathered from all our snooping is the pressure to keep putting up airs. So when creating our own social media personas, we cleverly conceal the reality of our private struggles. Opting instead for an exaggerated version, plastic version of the truth. We mask our hurts and weaknesses and deficiencies, 
promoting a caricature that may technically resemble ourselves under carefully calculated lighting, yet is vigilant to hide the flaws underneath. But perhaps modern technologies are not entirely to blame for these attempts to put a better face forward. A bit of writing that dates back to the fifth century to the fifth chapter of Second Kings, for example, opens with a long list of accomplishments concerning Naaman. His high-level bio sketch contains elements of accolade, appreciation, achievement, and, and admiration. He was a celebrated leader in the Syrian army. He accrued the respect of his subordinates and earned favor with his king. A great man, a valiant warrior, all the things you want included in your viewable profile. And yet peeking out from underneath the veneer of his success was this one little mention of something that couldn't stay hidden any longer. Naaman was a leper. As a career-finding man of brave and noble reputation, the last thing he wanted anyone to know was that he suffered from this worst kind of ailment, one that found little compassion from others and certainly no possibility of cure. Leprosy was the kind of disease that could lie dormant for more than a decade before revealing itself in an obvious public way. Until then, the sick person could strategically cover proof of its existence with careful clothing choices and self-protective mannerisms. In this way, it was possible to live as a functional leper. We've now mastered the art of functional leprosy, sick and blemished and hurting on the inside, but all polished and buttoned up on the outside. Perhaps anger boils in our heart. Perhaps a passionless, stale marriage barely exists within our home. Perhaps anxiety eats away at our peace of mind. Perhaps addiction robs us of freedom. Perhaps unforgiveness numbs our soul. Perhaps a lapse in integrity cloaks us with guilt. Yet we conceal these private pains from public knowledge with perfectly composed selfies. We're dying in plain sight. For surely this hidden leprosy will be the death of us all. Unless we let authenticity heal us first. If we will lay ourselves bare before the Lord and be honest about ourselves with trustworthy sojourners in the body of Christ, we can be restored from what's killing us. Today is the day for openness and vulnerability entrusting our real selves to the loving eyes of the Father. In my book, Your Creative Peace, Finding and Deepening Your Creative Voice While Connecting with God, I documented an interview I had with Jan Havilana. Her business name is Jan Havilana, Art and Words, and her preferred medium of creativity is mixed media. Here's a bio. I'm a mixed media artist with a passion for all things vintage, books, deep conversations, and seaside adventures with my three favorite men. With both a, a bachelor's degree in fine arts and graphic design and a master's of education and teaching, I spent the better part of my adult life trying very hard to be a grown up with a traditional job. After the birth of my two sons, my newfound mama love released me to follow my heart, reclaiming the artist that I'd always been. In 2007, I created a line of silver hand stamped jewelry under the name Hazel Hark, Hazelnut Cottage. Today, I revel in mixed media messes, making heartfelt connections with others through art and words. What is one of your earliest creative memories? That was a long time ago. Let's see, I remember drawing field mice standing under large mushrooms. As a youngster, I also loved to write short stories, poetry, you name it. I was even in a creative writing class when I was in elementary school and got one of my poems published in some kind of international children's magazine. How did you find your creative voice? I'm really only now discovering my creative voice. 
Like an adolescent, my voice is shaky. It cracks at times and can't seem to settle itself on one pitch. Still, I suppose I've found my way by doing the work. I show up in the studio regardless of my mood and do my best to choose the path of joy and love. Whenever I get to the point of confusion or insecurity about my artwork, I've been trying to listen to my gut, learning how to bravely allow myself to be led by God, to follow his leading, which usually means allowing myself to boldly let myself love what I love. Did your creative habits make a smooth transition into your adult life? Gosh, no. I could be the poster child for a non-linear, meandering artist. As I shared before, as a child, my first creative love was writing. Then in college, I fell into a string of studio art classes and chose to get my Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Graphic Design. I practiced in this field for a good number of years before leaving to pursue what I thought would be a more soul-quenching work, teaching. After getting my master's degree of education in teaching and teaching in the classroom for a few years, I left on maternity leave for seven years. During that time, I became a mom to two boys and through the transformation of motherhood, rediscovered my pure artistic passions. If you had a creative hiatus, what event or circumstance brought you back to your creative lifestyle? There was a time, nearly a decade, when I let go of all art making, and it has been a slow trip back to my creative roots and passions. Many things happened at once. The further away I wandered from the life of creativity, my depression worsened. A dear friend gave me a book entitled Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer. Right around the same time, I met a man who would become my mentor and pastor. At the same time, desperation at the thought of having to go back into the classroom full-time motivated me to find something I could do from home to earn an income. From this chaos came hope. I discovered the indie artist community and eventually Etsy. And soon afterwards, I created the line of hand stamp silver jewelry and Hazelnut Cottage was born. How has God been a part of your creative process? It has taken me a long time to embrace and run with my creative gifts, trusting that God will determine how to best use me and my artwork to accomplish his will in the world. There's a quote from Elizabeth O'Connor's The Eighth Day of Creation that says it best. A charismatic person is one who, by her very being, will be God's instrument in calling forth gifts. The person who is having the time of her life doing what she is doing has a way of calling forth the deeps of others. Such a person is herself good news. She is the embodiment of freedom of the new humanity. Verbal proclamation of the good news becomes believable. The person who exercises her own gifts to freedom in freedom can allow the Holy Spirit to do in others what he wants to do. I pray that I may be that person. Is there a particular moment where your creativity became infused into your, a spiritual practice? Without knowing it at first, yes, it has become a spiritual practice. My art studio becomes a sacred space, a quiet time of learning to listen to God and his promptings, a time of silent prayer as I send up my thoughts, my worries, my fears to him. In my art making, I learn to allow myself to be led by the Holy Spirit, listening, learning to be aware of his promptings, learning to walk in faith and trusting that God will help my art find its place in the world. Is there a particular thing that you do that ushers you into a place of worship? I would have to say quiet. When I work quietly without music or noise in the background, I find that I naturally fall into worship, a time when I begin to give voice to my love and devotion for God the Father and for Jesus. Sacred versus scared. Same letters, different outcomes. What are your thoughts on that? There is just the slightest difference between the two, isn't there? Yet the smallest change can result in a totally different experience. This fills me with both hope and caution at the same time. 
Favorite quote? Listen, are you breathing just a little and calling it life? Mary Oliver. <laughs>